Hello. Hello, Internet. Welcome to another Wednesday serial. They're super frequent, always on Wednesdays. It's great. So, I want to talk to you about the Marvel event, Inferno, which was mostly an X-Men event, but not the way I read it. Um... Yeah, so this thing happened like 88, 89, basically. It's it's saying publications started in October 88 and then ran through August 89. That's a that's a that's a long time for fire. Which maybe that's why I was so inspired to read it right now, because everything sucks. So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm I'm gonna break this down. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this in, like, tracks. So, it's going to make sense, but basically, the hell's on, well, Earth, but really New York City. Mostly. Uh, <laughs> so, it all starts in Exterminators, which is this four-part mini Louise Simonson and artist. <laughs> um going through and this is weird it spins out of something from x factor which is the 05 x-men at the time uh but really it's more akin to new mutants which is it's more fitting because a this ties directly into the new mutants track of inferno and also a number of the exterminator characters which were mostly rejects from the fallen angels mini from a short while before uh are in here so you have boom boom who has time bombs louise simonson loves the time bombs on boom boom and mentions them Three times every comic boom booms in from here till the, uh, the new wave takes over. Issues later, I, it's become a pet peeve of mine. Um, there's these Dumbo mutant kids who were the main part of the X Factor crossover. They actually look like weird, freaky people, and people don't like them because they look weird and freaky. So, you know, that's bad. Um, there's Richter, who's now a druid. I, that was nothing to do with any of the comics around here. He makes the ground shake. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's fire. There's the. There's this guy, Wiz Kid. He's this kid who just like can make techno magic, basically, but it's technology, not magic, which is important here. Um, yeah, I don't know. But they're fighting off Nastrith, who's nasty he's one of the big bads of inferno but weirdly not the main one for the new mutants track but basically this is where the goblins not as many of the demons but well this is where the demons come into play but it's precluded by goblins and a part of this is because there's a goblin and demon war going on and this goes to the lore talking about how goblins mostly steal children kind of like dingoes and they're all bad, and we're all caught up in this, and it's hell in New York. So there's this, like, fissure coming out, and there's goblins, and they're stealing kids. And the exterminators, you know, the reject kids who couldn't make the new mutants are out to save the day up until you get to the final issue, which guest stars the new mutants, and they help save the day. Uh, I mean, this goes pretty much like you'd expect, given all the information I told you. You can really infer the story from the covers, basically, is what I'm saying. So, uh, but uh, that's where I wanted to start reading, and that's where I did, because the reason I was reading Inferno is because I've been working my way through the New Mutants, and I hit issue 70, saw issue 71, thought, oh, how am I going to do this? Because I, I didn't know anything about Inferno. Um, really, so uh, I thought it was this big event, more the way Marvel events are now, where it's like this story and there's like weird offshoots with every story. I pretty much have to read it all, except for the really dumb crossover stuff. Turns out that holds true mostly, but <laughs> I bought it all anyways. Um, so, New Mutants. 
I assume most people don't know about magic and limbo and all that because I sure as shoot didn't until I started reading every frig fragging fraffling issue of New Mutants where they poorly try to explain it because it's all part of one of the most convoluted miniseries Marvel has ever published. Issues 1 through 4 Magic, which is Storm and Ileana, but it's really all about Ileana and Storm's gone by like the first issue basically. Except for Oh no, where's Ileana? Oh, she's in Limbo, which is hell. It is hell. It is not Limbo. It's hell. It's a hell dimension. That's why they call it Limbo. That's weird. Um, so anyways, Magic's mutant power is to transport her to Limbo, which is... I, it breaks, like, in my mind canon, I guess, kind of the rules of mutant powers, which should be derived from nature. So, like, Wolverine makes sense, you know, like, claws and stitching himself back together and people grafted on metal. Okay, fine. Um, you know, you can shoot lasers from your eyes. Fine, it's derived from the energy around you and output, you know, blah. Okay. Mental power is fine. It's from your head. But magic's power of transporting to hell feels like how is that a mutant power that is super weird anyways pet peeves aside it's just it's weird because it's also just kind of hard to get a grasp on so in in this uh world that she transports to um she is abused and tortured uh by Belesco who's a big bad demon man. And I've read interpretations that include sexual assault. They didn't put that on the forefront for obvious reasons. Uh, and if it's subtext, it is subtext. So uh, it's there if people want to infer it. I choose not to because she's eight um, and it's terrible enough as it is. So she comes out and she's older. She's teen, you know, new mutant age level. Um, all feisty and spicy and whatnot, and uh, I don't know. And so she's the angsty. She's kind of the Wolverine of the New Mutants team through the run when she comes in, like after the first two arcs. So she's considered one of the main ones, but she wasn't there from the jump, even though she was one of the characters that was established before the jump, which is interesting. So, but we're we're at it's almost seventy five issues, so whatever um she's definitely part of the team and now we've been building to her losing control of limbo uh which is represented through her soul sword which is a sword that like makes bad magic go away Pacha. um so i don't know they kind of change the rules of the sword a little bit here and there as they go whether or not it actually has any true physical manifestation or damage so There you go. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the the reason I bring that up is because A, it's her nom de plume. Also, we're dealing with X swords right now, so it's top of mind. But also, there's a lot of visualization of, like, there's her sword in Limbo and, like, the evil, like, masses and throngs of demons encroaching to, like, it's only, like, a small circle around her sword. And that's the level of power she controls. Whereas before, she had influence of, over the entire land, and now it's, like, only as far as she can swing her sword, is what she can keep at bay. And um, due to shenanigans prior, um, the new moons needed her to leave a rift open um, because she uses it to like transport them across the world and do other things. And they did, and then one of these times it leaves a rift between where she transported New York to Limbo, and then demons start crawling out, which is where the exterminator demons come from directly, is that rift. Uh, so she's responsible. It's her realm that she's responsible for, that she's been battling lose control throughout the entire run, basically. There's a big connection point between her and Magneto, and, like, control and needing to, like control their people or their kingdom as it were and talking about that and how young she is and how that shouldn't be on her whereas magneto is struggling to do it and he's you know an old gray hair um 
struggling with it and taking on a new mantle in the Hellfire Club, which is interesting and plays into the Mayu right before and right after Inferno, but not Inferno itself. But it's if you've been reading, it's hanging in the background. Um, blah, blah, blah. I'm saying all this because, like, the... <sighs> The problem with Inferno is you can't just read Inferno and get it. There's so much lore. There's so much impenetrable X-Men bullshit that to make heads or tails of it or understand the meaning of any of it that's going to have any character. Because this is like nothing but character moments and demon fighting. And you're only going to get the demon fighting if you don't get it. So like... The reason why this is upheld as one of the bigger X events is interesting. It's been called kind of a sequel to the Dark Phoenix Saga, and I think that's because of something in a different track we'll get there, but that's only like a fraction of this beast of comics. So, where am I going with this? So, eventually, Ileana stops being magic and becomes Dark Child, who's the red whatever there, who... Nastrith is pushing magic to become Dark Child so that they can rule Limbo together and they'll be like king and queen. And eventually, Colossus comes in and helps save saves his sister and with the New Mutants. And what they ultimately do, the New Mutants and them, is like do this weird time travel thing. But the, the time travel is held within Limbo, which is weird and stupid magic stuff anyway so it doesn't feel like a time travel thing they essentially have to enter this series of doors which is an ever escalating number of trials to essentially claim iliana before she was truly tortured like she know at this point she like knows limbo belisco has like started to talk to her like so she's aware of limbo and her power and what could happen but it it hasn't gone through there um, and so they grab that magic, that magic, it's not even magic, it's Ileana back. So at the end of Inferno, they have Ileana, this eight-year-old Russian kid who can't speak a lick of English on the team, and they're struggling with that. And I forgot, through this entire time, the, the demons and masses that have been coming out are led by Sim, who is Belesco's lieutenant, and after Belesco was killed, um, Sim has slowly been taking over and pushing against Ileana. And so he's, uh, he gets killed. Uh, and it, I, I say this around all this because it's almost like inconsequential. Like the bad guy gets d dead. Okay. It, it, it's like, it's like they have to resolve that, but it's not really part of what the Mayu and interesting part is. So, I don't know. They deal with all this nonsense, um, and then they're dealing with X Factor... Uh, X Factor... X Terminators here at this one convergent spot in Inferno where all these different parts come together where... There's a big like explosion in the sky and then they're able to gather pretty much all the kids that the demons and goblins have taken away into an area and start returning them to the people of New York. Um, and then there's a weird little uh, rejoinder and cloak and dagger dealing with some of that and how it affects the mutants because cloak and dagger had to be dragged in at the last minute because they're technically mutants i guess i didn't even actually know that or care cloak and dagger suck y'all that that's my hot take there there you go was that rambly enough for you all right well let's talk about a more direct path um excalibur gets involved don't know who Excalibur is? I sure didn't. So I went and started reading the entire thing because by the time you get to Inferno, you're at issue. Hmm, hold on. Um, ba, 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 four. So I read, you know, a whole three. No, no, four, five. Sorry, you're at six. So I read a few issues of Excalibur before diving into Inferno, so I knew who Excalibur was, so I had something to say. So Excalibur does not start at issue one, much like New Mutants doesn't start at issue one. It starts with the Excalibur special, which, much like the New Mutants special, is like 
vignettes introducing the characters, except with Excalibur they're all introduced characters already, so it's even weirder. Um, except at the time it was weirder because they were playing off of a lot of lore of Captain Britain, who's the non-mutant character along with his girlfriend in this. But those comics weren't released in America, and whereas they technically have been collected editions, they're pretty hard to find around here still. So, effectively, a blind spot to a majority of the audience who's going to be reading this, even though this is a comic that takes place primarily, you know, across the pond. So, we get our kind of crisis and, you know, conversion with... Um, Phoenix, Kitty Pride, and Nightcrawler, who all know each other X-Men wise, and then, you know, Captain Britain and his girlfriend, yay, and they're fighting off these Dumbo things. And um yeah, it's I know this series eventually gets goofier and it starts to show in its covers, like with issue four, uh, with this guy Red to give out, you know, like where's the hot babes and all the action, not here. Um and there's a lot of body swapping stuff going on in the first few stories, which is so hard for me to follow because I I don't really know Phoenix. I know Kitty Pride, I know Nightcrawler, I don't really know Captain Britain. So like playing with mixing up these characters from the get-go is hard because I don't really know them yet, so I it doesn't play well. There's a juggernaut issue I do really like with them fighting and showing kind of more the uh, importance of using, you know, using your head, using mental abilities over just uh, punching really hard and flying. Um, and then a fun with it with arcade, but that has body swap stuff too. And then Inferno comes along, and basically they know something's wrong in New York, and they go to help is what they do and they find themselves dealing with these demons and powers kind of being sapped away from them or ultimately being useless because they're fighting magic and monsters and all this otherworldly stuff that they're not really prepared or capable for and it kind of leaves them drained which is interesting for a team dynamic but again like like, this team hasn't had a chance to, like, just do a mission, complete it, and, like, have a status quo one, you know? Um, they're just kind of always rolling. And then I even read the eighth issue, including this, because it's Mayhem in Manhattan. It's dealing a lot with Captain Brynn, dealing with um, some power fallout stuff, and just some fun uh, cultural stuff that Claremont's playing with. And... These, this is a fun diversion, and it's showing kind of the scale of what's going on. It was also here to kind of give the old X characters the big shock when the X-Men come back from the dead. So maybe I should just get to the, the meat of this before I talk about the uh, errata of it. <coughs> okay, so... The meat of this keeps flopping between Uncanny X-Men and X-Factor for all kinds of... I mean, these are the big X-Books, right? Like, you have the original five, and then you have the big, the bad, the Uncanny X-Men, and... Hallelujah, I, uh, this is loaded with all kinds of stuff with like early appearances from sinister before i feel like he was fully formed as a character here he's more because in more recent comics there, there's a comical edge to him where in the past he was just this like mischievous bad guy who is sometimes subservient to apocalypse and other times not but supposed to be like nefarious on his own um Mysteries wrapped in mysteries wrapped in who cared because at what point do you not establish something? Um, as seen in Spider-Man right now with Kindred. Um, so, so by the time we get to the second X-Men one, 
Uh, this cover really says a lot, right? Okay. Nyaster, Mr. Sinister, the Goblin Queen, the Marauders, this one's got it all. So early in Inferno, the big thing is that the X-Men have been dealing with the last event pretty much since, which is the Australian period, where they are dead to the world because the world saw them die um, after the Marauders kicked their lily asses. So... They've been kind of licking their wounds, regrouping, and dealing with a new status quo, new area, and kind of being more, like, covert. And it's it's a different method mode, which is interesting, but this was kind of a push to reset some of it. And um, in doing so, we play with kind of the book that's been maybe making some of that possible, in some ways, I'd argue. <coughs> Which is X Factor playing in New York and just doing what mutants do, fighting oppression by pretending to be the oppressors and the whole exterminator angle of that run, which if you're familiar with would make sense. And if not, that's 35 issues of story that I can't get into right now because I haven't fully read them yet. But what um, X Factor has going for it is the heart of this, I guess. And then X-Men has the drive of it. So X-Men's covering more of the villains and the plot. And then X-Factor's covering the why we're here and what people probably really cared about at this point, which is a whole lot. Um, so at this point, so we had the Inferno side with mostly the demons, with magic, Dark Child, and all that. And Colossus kind of ends up over there, dealing with his sister, in an uncharacteristic move of Claremont actually putting characters that are related to each other actually dealing with each other, um, which also happens in these books, but it's a <laughs> clutch point. So, with X-Factor, you have Cyclops and Jean Grey. But there was Madeline Pryor. And here's where most people argue Cyclops' biggest failing was. Cyclops had left Madeline Pryor and his child to go be with Jean Grey and do this whole X-Factor thing. But she didn't really tell him the whole story at the same time. There's a lot of... Uh, again, I haven't read it all, so I don't know. Um... Meanwhile, Madeline Pryor's freaking out, but also has been turning to the arms of his brother, Havoc, who's now on the X-Men. And she's been working with the X-Men with their computer stuff, so she's their computer person. So even though she's human, which she isn't, um, <laughs> she decides to get embroiled with, you know the brother of her ex-lover and now it's this whole thing except she snaps and becomes the goblin queen um mostly around the time sinister informs her that she's a clone of jean gray and she was essentially created to jive scott crazy <sighs> yeah so I've been watching documentaries, reading books and whatnot about the Claremont era of X-Men, also following the excellent Claremont run Twitter feed and all that, which has some videos on YouTube and other posts about this. And Claremont meant for Jean Grey to be dead. She was supposed to be dead. It was supposed to be buried and settled and moved on. And so eventually... Marvel decided X-Men was selling too darn well, and so X-Factor is going to come up, which was the first X-Book spinoff that he didn't have ownership of. They gave it to someone else to write, and he'd been struggling to try to make sure if there's any spinoffs, he was doing it. So to keep in line with everything, he was doing X-Men, and then he started doing some minis with like Wolverine and Magic, and I think like long shot and someone else um and then in there he started up the new mutants so that he'd have these other characters and other motivations and eventually kind of became more of a horror book so kind of like a tone different thing than the x-men 
uh, to have, you know, more, but different. But eventually that wasn't enough either. So Simonson came on and was doing X Factor. Uh, but uh, apparently part of that was that Gene was coming back, which was something that he was promised they wouldn't do. And they did, because they wanted the 05 back. So Gene's back, but before that, they've had this Madeline Pryor character who was eerily similar I don't know where he was quite going with that, but I think it was just supposed to be that she was and move on. It was supposed to be maybe a touch more subtle and, you know, about moving on and then doing new things. Because I know his vision for the X-Men was that, you know, every so many years, if you just kind of checked in, the cast would be mostly completely different. But the X-Men would continue, but one age's X-Men would be a pretty different cast from the next. Uh, is how he stated, which is kind of makes sense. And if you follow his run, follows through, like there was some holding on and then he kind of let go of Cyclops and then, you know, it was Storm and all the giant size X-Men that didn't die in plane explosions or whatever. And then some of those were phased out and then we got, you know, Longshot or Rogue coming in later, things like that. And so it kind of continued and rolled on. Um, and I believe Inferno is where we kind of see some of that snapback because it's some of the elements of X Factor really starting to play in with X Men because atop the spinoffs and all that, they also were demanding big events roughly every year. And how do you do that every year? Because it can't be as big as this. Uh, <laughs> so. Madeline Pryor and Jean Grey fight. A lot of it's around Scott. Scott's trying to say, you know, kill them, not me. It's my fault. I'm trying to do the heroic thing. She's not having it. Um, Mr. Sinister's pulling some strings in the background and then kind of slouches off. Um, the X-Men become demonized and X-Factor has to fight them. And... Archangel was pulled for a bit for a while too because he was already on the darker side of himself. Uh, this is when Warren was super angsty and not the most fun for that character. Uh, so we have all these character revelations. You know, the X Men aren't dead. You know, Madeline Pryor's here and she was the clone and all that. And it's just all this like super heightened soap drama melodrama stuff that's the corniest stuff without it being super earned kind of being dumped all at once amidst this hellscape and new york being in the throngs of hell and all of it all of it oh and um Havoc's being churned to a demonic character because the Goblin Queen, Madeline Pryor, uh, has taken him as her mate, basically. And she's turning the tables on Sinister, she's turning the tables on the Astrith, and she's going to be the big demon ruler. And ultimately, the big fight comes down to her versus... Long shot. Because we needed another big character moment in here, and this is a guy who's been floating with the X-Men and had his moments, but I mean, this is his big, like, heroic stand. Uh, and so he's able to start turning the tide, and then, you know, they're able to push out the demons and all that. Um, and in the throw of it, because of all the children, the, the heart of that is because Madeline Pryor wants her child there. And she renames the Summers baby here. And this is where he gets his name Nathan. Which isn't what they were calling the baby at first. Which threw me through loop. I don't know anything about that. So she, Nathan Summers is called Nathan Summers because Nathan was the name of Scott's schoolyard bully, basically. And she just wanted to name him Nathan to piss him off. I take that cable.
I... There, there's just all kinds of nonsense stuff that feels so unimportant to the relative Mayu of X-Men now compared to like other events I've read of X-Men that get settled here. And it's just, it's nearly incomprehensible um, because they're trying to pack so much. I mean, it's not, I mean, there's a lot of comics here, but it's, it's set against all this nonsense and no one story is allowed to kind of resolve so a whole bunch gets resolved in like the last two to three issues and it just gets worse and worse as we go along like some big blockbuster movie it's it's a wild ride it's fun if you know your x-men but if you don't like i've been saying you cannot start with inferno this is this is pretty impenetrable stuff this is uh this is maybe the height of not being someone's first <laughs> X-Men book. And I, I want to point out, I've been skipping all kinds of plot points because it seems so freaking irrelevant. The reason Sim was such a big reason to fight was because he got infected with the techno-organic virus because of something WizKid did in, X in Exterminators. And like, so... He's part demon, part technology, so he's safe from the sword and he's safe from all this other stuff, but ultimately it's that amalgamation that kills him because they're able to essentially churn the two forces on each other within himself. Um, so I, that, that that's one part. There's also a bit about like the forces of limbo versus the forces of hell. I, there's just so much going on and so much of it, just like the minute you put it down and this event goes away, just you wash your hands of it uh so if this doesn't make sense and i've been rambling i just apologize but i that's how i felt reading this it's interesting but it's it's a lot um yeah so let's keep going through the through the throngs of it and like here's the thing those are the two main tracks let's talk about the other half of the event now <laughs> There's the Spider-Man section, which is something I promised people I'd talk about, because Spider-Man and X-Men. I thought this was going to be more of a thing. Spider-Man does not intersect with the freaking rest of this, nor does pretty much any other book I'm going to talk about uh, for the next while. So all this crazy stuff is happening in New York because the Inferno is happening, but that's all the mutants thing. The people of New York have to deal with the consequences. They don't know what's going on. They don't know this is all about the fact that basically Scott's a shitty father. Thanks, buddy. Inferno. Uh, oh, also Magic has some emotional issues and should have been dealing with them, but Magneto should have helped her earlier. That's the other half. And so a bunch of people have to suffer and die. If it was real, it would be tragic, but it's Marvel, so it's hilarious. Um... So it all starts for Spider-Man with a Mysterio issue where he believes Mysterio is faking these demons and whatnot and he fights them off. But Mysterio wasn't faking all of it. And so this is just like a really confusing way to enter it because they don't like if it was a play and then Mysterio's like, that ain't mine. They're like, oh, no, like that would have been an interesting. But that's not how they play it at all. Like Spider-Man doesn't realize it was a real demon until we get to the next issue. So it's like a weird red herring Mysterio issue. This is my least favorite Mysterio comic, not just because Todd McFarlane drew it like todd mcfarlane spider-man i'm weird um here we get the first big green goblin hobgoblin fight which isn't a true one a it's harry and harry is sane and he's putting on the green goblin costume to fight off the hobgoblin because the hobgoblin is terrorizing his family um this thread starts here kind of but not really because it starts it starts in like spectacular it like runs concurrent with that issue and then it also is happening through a majority of <laughs> these spectacular 
issues as well. So trying to like talk about this title by title doesn't work because there's like this one story and then there's other parts of it. So yeah, so there's this whole thing with the Hobgoblin and essentially Norman Oz... Not Norman. Pfft. Sorry, I just got off reading the new Spider-Man stuff, which is all about Norman. So Harry Osborn is fighting for his family, basically, and using the tools at his availability, which happen to be Green Goblin stuff, and that goes south pretty fast. But he pitches it pretty quick, in a way, to kind of make Spider-Man feel guilty, because he's like, all this stuff is for a younger man. I have a family and a business to worry about. <laughs> like, uh, it's a really good play with the character that I know ultimately doesn't actually go where it's supposed to or land where it's supposed to land. Because eventually he goes nutsoid and gets killed. But that's a more famous story. So, <laughs> um, so, so Spider-Man's fighting off um, Harry's the Osborne factory, which becomes possessed and starts attacking people, which is an inferno tie-in because it happens because New York's crazy right now. And the example they use in almost every one of the spinoffs is like a mailbox growing teeth and trying to eat people. But there's other stuff attacking people too. Um, there's a big hobgoblin fight here, except the hobgoblin here is um, cursing. And this is not the original hobgoblin. This is like hobgoblin three. I think I, I lose track. Um, but he's trying to kill Spider-Man, of course, but all this demon stuff's going on. So he goes and he finds the Astrith. He deals with the actual X-Men side of it. Spider-Man doesn't. And so he goes and he basically says, like, you know, what are you looking for? Souls? I'll trade you by soul for power. And the Astrid laughs at him, like, souls, souls, you humans are so hilarious. But fine, fine. You amused me, fine. So here, I'll trade your soul for the power of the demons that you see around you, and you'll have that. So he becomes the Demo Goblin. Not Demo Goblin yet, but Demon Hobgoblin here. And so he freaks out at Spider-Man. Spider-Man's like, what the f what? And he's not having it very well. And he's freaked out that he's a demon, which is stupid because he asked to be. So I don't love this. I Which is funny because for years I'm like, how did the Demo Goblin happen? That seems way out of the realm for Spider-Man. And I read it and I don't like it. Um, yeah. Uh, during all this, there's a big lizard fight. Doesn't really play in. It doesn't really play in at all. Um, my favorite issue of the Spider-Man Inferno stuff is J. Jonah Jameson and Spider-Man defending the Bugle's staff from demons besieging the Bugle. And Spider-Man is fighting. You know, he's already torn up and he's fighting... Basically, he's hanging upside down because his ribs are cracked, so he can't move too much. So he's, like, punching with one arm and shooting webs while dangling upside down. And jo Jonah Jameson just has this two-by-four and is going at it, too. And eventually, um, Spider-Man passes out. And J. Jonah Jameson, you know, is telling people to, like, leave his identity alone. is actually, you know, being kind and saying kind things about Spider-Man until the moment Spider-Man wakes up and is like... I have somewhere I need to be. Oh my god, what time is it? And then J. Jonah Jameson's so mad that he's on Grape Floor or whatever, and it's like, it's a, it's a classic Spider-Man move in the midst of all this nonsense. Um, and then uh, the last Inferno Spider-Man issue, at least the order I read them in, was this... Night of the Living Ned, where these corpses come and besiege. Where Ned's corpse comes and, like, uh, creeps out his old family. And it's actually kind of a horrifying issue. And is it's, it's more like a Blackest Night tie-in, except that was a Green Lantern DC thing. But it's, it's like that idea in a way. Um, but for a Spider-Man comic, which is... 
not the worst idea for a Spider-Man arc if you want to go for a horror idea, because there's so many, like, relationships and uh, ways to bring back the dead that would just, like, kill so many characters on the inside, but not have to actually kill them, but, you know, make them sad and have dramatic consequences. Uh... This is a weird ride, and it, again, for Inferno, this is like an era of Marvel I haven't read around much. Um, I know more about the Spider-Man stuff here than the X-Men, just because you only have to track Peter Parker and a few other characters. So, um, yeah, the this is some interesting stuff. I think it's better when you get away from Amazing. Frankly, I, I think the art gets better, um, the storytelling's better, and you can understand what's going on because there's actual stakes within an issue that aren't resting on 300 issues of history. So, they, they're actually told within their own rights. So, I, yeah interesting but it's a weird moment for spider-man who basically is just dealing with like new york's crazy right now i'm gonna try to help out and not investigate or get to the root of the situation whatsoever yeah and then uh, uh, there's the 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 the, the tie-ins so <laughs> there's the avengers they're there, except uh, this first issue actually is in the Avengers. It's Jarvis impressing this lady um, by being somewhat heroic as he's going about town. And apparently his mom is like more like an average New Yorker than some like British aristocrat. Or this kind of person you believe a butler would come from. So that was interesting. Uh, to see Jarvis deal like with this big robot, which has nothing to do with Inferno, but it was interesting. And then we get the new Avengers team, which is friggin' Mr. Fantastic and the Invisible Woman. Uh, Thor, sure. Uh, Steve Rogers as the captain. Something was going on there, I have no idea. And then friggin' Gilgamesh. He's ugly. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, the, the Inferno stuff is, again, like, the mailboxes are attacking people and some stuff, but they're actually dealing with, like, a big robot and something that has nothing to do with anything, and this is, like, the shortest live of Avengers team, so there you go. I didn't like that at all, but I don't like Avengers. Then there's the Fantastic Four, Sans... Mr. Fantastic or the Invisible Woman. So it's like the Human Torch, the Thing, She Thing, and uh, what, She Hulk or something? Or maybe it's just the three of them. They're fighting Graviton. Again, amidst New York being crazy. Kang's in there. I couldn't. I don't know. <laughs> then there's the Power Pack, which actually felt like it was. So there's this boogeyman who's a demon who's, like, attacking their home by, like, making the sewage shoot out the water tap and then, like, blood flow out from the sink and, like, everything's smelling rotten and terrible. It's just, like, well, it's just, like, this really visceral, gross thing and they have to, like, fight off a demon that's, like, made their home hell. It's interesting, but I also hate it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. And eventually the new mutants come and help. Again, because there's that moment with the kids where there's the explosion in the sky and they all meet up. And the exterminators are there too. There you go. Daredevil deals with some demons that say he dresses like one of them. It's interesting... But it doesn't do anything for the greater story at all or connects to it, nor... Like, you feel like Daredevil would, like, swing in and do something. I, I don't know, man. There's a lot of nothing. 
And then there is my favorite part. Daniel Hopeless takes on Inferno during the whole Secret Wars thing and actually tells a story with it. Um, assuming most of the events of Inferno happen, you deal with it, and then Peter's off to go try to save magic on an annual basis in one of their annual fights. Cyclops gets reduced to being in a chair, so he's the new Professor Xavier-like character. And there's all these characters going for it. Um, and there's two warring factions of hell, the goblins and the demons, and the X-Men are inserting themselves into this war to try to take back what's theirs, essentially, which is the hearts of these battles and so they side with the goblin queen such that they might be able to get iliana back which would give one side to hell but they've been trying i also forgot to mention in the process uh colossus gets the sword but also not pictured there is he's missing one of his hands so he has this like possessed hand to help him hold it uh it's this whole crazy story it's told in five issues it's actually really powerful um i thought it was taking a lot of the crazy lore and stuff set up with an inferno and actually made it relevant to the characters so you don't have all the setup and then like all the relative important stuff on you know set to the side but actually merged the two it's it's a really cool rejoiner to read after pushing through all that so i'm sorry i know this video was a mess that's how i felt reading it it is just a lot it is just a lot of nonsense and bs and this i so so i don't know there's a lot to like learn about x-men lore and all that but i think more looking at this story is one thing like a with these events any of the careless tie-ins that feel like they wouldn't connect i think we've learned and here it is from one of the earlier events they don't not really it doesn't matter it's peripheral and if you like the characters you're reading that run it's a fun moment with them great otherwise yeah uh <laughs> but i i mean within the story proper magic is BS. It can be fun if you have Harry Potter or anything where you have a world and there's reasons for it and there's rules around it. But if you just introduce magic into a story, not the character, the idea, it it's harder to write a good story with it, which makes things like Hellblazer more impressive. Or a lot of the DC magic stuff like around Swamp Thing or um, the Books of Magic... Or even like within fables, because there's rules and reasons, and it feels like it doesn't feel like a convenience. It doesn't feel like it's making things happen. It feels like method mode, much like the mutant powers. Like effectively, like if you look past any narrative constraint, but look at it as a narrative tool, the mutant powers are magic. Cyclops can shoot friggin' beams from his eyes. Jean Grey can lift things with her minds. Those are magic powers just attributed to a different reason any superhero sort of thing follows this but you give them rules reasons limits to help tell the story which is i believe why a lot of people fall off of something like superman because his powers feel like they change it feels like they're so unlimited he could do anything what are what's the threat what's the meaning when you read a good superman story you see why that works though magic can let us tell more powerful stories with exciting and interesting tools but in inferno all the hellscape all of the bits and bobs and supposed rules that are set up to be reversed are just that it's like it's like watching a bad anime with like power levels and you know how things interplay off of each other and it's like this like video game mechanical like way to beat something like there's a rule written somewhere how to beat it and all the heroes have to do is find it and then implement it and it's done um to go to video games like that like the best there's two great examples i want to use to kind of make my point here the first is uh metal gear solid 
Psycho Manus. Um, if you haven't, it, it was this thing that blew people's minds. It's one of the it's one of the standout moments in video gaming, frankly. Like this boss was able to tell you like certain games you had played. Um, if it was on your map, like the mechanics of it have been figured out. But like if you were a kid playing at the time or someone just playing it at the time and all of a sudden you're playing this game and they're telling you like, oh, you like this other game. You're like, what the f it's a mind freak. It's a direct mind freak because it knew something about you and you're not expecting this video game boss to know something about you, the player, not the character, the player. It it creates an immediacy, right? It's using weird rules to like break the fourth wall. Also then like, uh, you know, put down the controller and it shakes to the left and the right. It was this whole scripted sequence, like create all this mysticism and to beat him, you had to take your physical plug-in controller and move it to another thing. Like it was all this like mysticism, like weird rules in order to beat it which is amazing the first time when the magic's there. Then, like I said, the rules are figured out. You get to that boss and you're playing it and you move the controller, you plug in your memory card to another thing and you just kind of shoot him. <laughs> it's He's the easiest boss in the game once you know how, because once the... Once you have the know-how, there's nothing to the execution. He's just floating around waiting to get shot. Um, he'll throw a table at you, but you don't even have to worry about it. Um, it's it's the performative idea of magic right there. You know, the, the sleight of hand, the, the performance, the shifting you out of your comfort zone. That's how street magic works. That's what it was. And once you get past the illusion, it, it falls flat. It, it's it, He quickly went from being considered, like I said, this historic and amazing moment in video gaming history to kind of a sideshow. It's still talked about, but it's talked about different because people know now, even if they haven't played the game, they know the the, the magic's gone. The the other equ equivalent there for that in a similar way is like pretty much any Zelda boss. If you haven't played a Zelda game, you'll go through a dungeon. Well, many dungeons, but for any given boss, you go through their dungeon. In the process of doing so, you get some item. Then you use that item to beat the boss. There's kind of a procedural way to look for hitting their weak spot. And you have to kind of figure out the mechanics of attacking them with the weapon in the fight. Most of these hold up better, just because, I mean, the, the playing of it holds up. But, you know, there's an excitement in figuring it out, in figuring out the rules and doing it and whatnot. But the magic still retains because it's not... It's not, you know, look at my hand, what am I doing over here? It is what it is flat. And that is how most stories are, and that's how they treat most magic most of the time. This is a sideshow. Inferno is a sideshow most of the time, trying to distract you with all this grandeur for what should be a series of character moments. Because what comes out of Inferno is... The X-Men are alive, but they're reintroduced to the world and they have to reconnect with a bunch of other characters that we know and care about, assuming you're following all the books or at least have some tangential relation to them. You're resetting one main character in Ileana. You're dismissing Madeline Pryor's arc, essentially, by making her a clone, making her relevant, making her evil, and then putting her away. Which is interesting because that is where we get to the Dark Phoenix sequel. So, Madeline Pryor has gone evil, assumed all this power, done this thing, become one of the biggest villains of the X-Men, and then is gone. Partially, due to, it's not quite the same as Dark Phoenix in that she kind of has a moment of clarity and realizes, oh my god, I'm a bitch, and dies. 
which I think is um, holy in scripture with Dark Phoenix. So, I, <laughs> ah, um, trying to like draw those parallels are interesting, but I mean, we also then have Jean Grey who has a son, but it isn't real like genetically it is but it's not her son um but she's responsible for it. and so we have this weird disconnect um that moves forward and i don't know it, it takes a lot of x-men lore from the moment and i think i i mean it shifts it shifts so much um, in X Factor, it's pretty much a short hop, skip, and a jump from here before X Factor is proper X Factor in my mind, which is like Havoc, Multiple Man, Polaris, like the new X Factor team that's X Government and not the O5, which I know is the original X Factor, but I always think of as like not really X Factor because it's, it's they're they're just X Men, they always will be. And that's who they are first. Um, we have X-Men at the time, like I said, back in the world, all that, dealing with it. But we also have them kind of returning to the greater Marvel world at this point and playing more with the Mayu of everything and getting back to more of what we want to see, more character interactions and consequences with... The greater marvel world and it's wild yet but i mean it's also kind of like an error or two before we get to claremont's leaving and then with the new mutants um <laughs> they they get integrated with like i said the exterminator characters for a while which is louise simonson's like dying out of the new mutants like she has them for a small run's worth where she basically runs the book into the ground because she takes most of it. She sends them off to Asgard to deal with something that was happening with Thor, but Thor isn't in it. It's just Asgard and them and blah, 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 which they've been there before for too long. And so they're doing that again, and it gets old quick. There's one good issue in there, which is a flashback. Um back to when they're at the school and the school's alive or not blown up oh that's the other thing the expansion gets blown up in inferno sorry it's an x event do i really have to say it um uh, so the new mutants are supposed to be on their own but we don't get the consequence of that because they're stuck in this other world where they're housed and quartered and fed and so like the idea of kids being on their own dealing with that is just brushed aside with no consequence which sucks because that's what new moon should dig into um and then from there we're pretty much into <clears throat> the road to x-force which is when liefeld takes over and once we do that it's just dumb guns and action and yeah, blah, 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 blah. so <clears throat> I don't know. Inferno feels very much in a lot of ways like the real start to the end. I, I know that there's another big event, which actually is the end of the era. And then from there, it's all kind of like falling pieces till this era of X-Men, which was, you know, Claremont's run, the new mutants entire run, um, X-Factor going from this to being the new team, all that hard split to the 90s which is where my generation knew x-men which is was more of a corporate endeavor than like this claremont brainchild happened and so i don't know that this sits in a really weird position of all that and having not read all of it before or after is it's impossible and I don't recommend it. <laughs> I don't know. I, I've been blabbing here, and I'm. I'm sorry. I. I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. That that's what I say about Inferno. I don't know. Magic's dumb. 